Well, hello everyone. It's great to be with you once more. In just two weeks, we will be back at church. By then, it will have been more than four months since our last worship service. It seems really hard to believe. So we really are looking forward to seeing you again. And I'd just like to reiterate for those folk who have said that they would rather wait a little longer, that we will continue to post these videos. Thank you to those of you who've responded to our email during this past week. We are trying to get some idea of how many services we will need to offer in order to accommodate everyone who would like to be here. Early indications are that two services on a Sunday will probably suffice, but we will confirm that with you. If you've yet to respond to the email of last week, please could I ask you to do so as soon as possible or we'll give the church office a ring. If you did not receive an email from us, that's because we don't have your email address. So please let us have it and we will add you to our mailing list. You can also respond by merely replying with a comment to this video, either on Facebook or on YouTube, and we will get in touch with you. You might remember from last Sunday that we considered John the Baptist's bold declaration, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We also looked at how uncompromising John was in declaring just who Jesus is. And we've also in recent weeks studied the execution of John. His faith ultimately cost him his life. I had a couple of questions during this past week asking about a crucial question which John asked in Luke 7 verse 19 and in Matthew 11 verse 3. Are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? Now at first glance this really does seem to be a rather strange question and there would appear to be some kind of faith crisis for John here which is something we can all identify with and so that's our subject for today. Our scripture reading is from Luke chapter 17, starting at verse 18. John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to, sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury, in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So what do we do when our faith is shaken? John was in prison because he did what God called him to do. He was sent to be the forerunner of the Messiah. John preached what God wanted him to preach. He called everyone who heard him to repentance and to faith in the Messiah. He did everything that God asked him. He even accused King Herod of a sinful lifestyle because he was in an adulterous relationship with his sister-in-law. This is what we looked at last Sunday. John was then thrown into, into Herod's prison for his troubles, for telling the truth and for saying the things that needed to be said things that nobody else had the courage to say. But this boldness ultimately cost John his life. John was the forerunner. He introduced Jesus as the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Through it all, though, his faith was now shaken. He was no skeptic, but he was in prison for his trouble, and things were about to become much worse for him. 
John stands as a reminder that sometimes God's will for his children is not comfort and security, but rather trials and suffering. The Pharisees and the experts in the law, on the other hand, had no faith at all. Instead, they relied on their own false righteousness. They were non-believers when it came to John the Baptist. They said that he was possessed by a demon. They even accused Jesus of being a drunkard and a glutton. They were offended when John and Jesus preached repentance to them. You see, the true gospel, when correctly proclaimed to the rebellious heart, is always offensive. So don't be offended when others are offended, when you accurately, yet faithfully and graciously share the gospel. As 1 Peter 4 verse 16 says, If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. And so Jesus restores the faith of John, and he restores the people's confidence in John as a true prophet. John was in prison for doing the right thing. And when his faith was tested, he went to the one person that we need to go to when our faith is tested. John went to Jesus. Now, of course, he was in prison, so he couldn't go in person. So he sent messengers instead. His personal struggles were beginning to take a toll on his faith. And as he lay in prison, he was asking himself, is Jesus really the Messiah? Was he really the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world? Was he the one, or should we look for someone else? Why is all this happening to me? If Jesus was the Messiah, why am I here in prison? It's easy for us to criticize John here, but his doubts were beginning to nag at him, just like the doubts come when we go through times of struggle. The problem is that most people, when they do doubt, don't go to Jesus Christ. Where did John go when he felt overwhelmed by his circumstances? When he doubted Christ, he went to Christ. Since he couldn't go himself, he sent two messengers. And they asked Jesus the questions which John had. Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for someone else? Things were not going like he'd hoped. And he was confused, and he couldn't understand what God was doing. This is a rhetorical question, I know, but have you ever been in that situation? Have you ever been confused and tried by the will of God? And Jesus answered John's messengers in the most amazing way. He basically said to them, just stand there and watch. Don't take someone else's word for it, Jesus said to them. I want you to see for yourselves. There and then he healed people with diseases. He cast out evil spirits. He restored sight to the blind. What we are given here is, is a glimpse of the perfect timing of God. At that very moment that John's friends came to Jesus, Jesus was ready to perform these signs and wonders so that John's disciples would be witnesses of these signs and that could, could then go back and share with John and confirm that Jesus is indeed the one that they had been promised. From verse 21, at that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go, and re go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have had leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. John needed to be reminded that even though his immediate future was bleak and about to become much worse, the day was coming when Jesus will reign over all the earth. In our time of such uncertainty and upheaval, we need to remember that these things will pass. The day is coming when Jesus' reign will be total and it will be eternal. John, in his darkest hour, knew that truth, and so can we. Jesus currently reigns in the hearts of believers, but a day is coming when all of the earth will be his footstool, and his reign will be universal. This is the principle of what is sometimes called the now, but not yet. Satan is a defeated foe, 
but total victory will only come at the triumphant return of Jesus. Or for us, when we draw our last breath here and enter into eternity, whichever of those two events occurs first. As we look around us, we know instinctively that something is wrong. The world is not meant to be this way. It is broken and it is getting worse. It is not getting better. But we have the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. The full glory of the kingdom is yet to be revealed, but we can take heart in the truth that it is coming. God keeps his word and his promises can be trusted. John was able to place his trust in Jesus, and we too can place our lives in the hands of Christ. Jesus then says something very interesting about John. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. What does this even mean? Firstly, John's greatness came because he was the one given the task of introducing Jesus Christ to the world. All of the prophets before John longed to see the day when their prophecies would come to pass. But only John was prophesied and then lived to see it unfold. That was a tremendous privilege for him. And so his greatness came because of his role as the forerunner. Yet Jesus says, the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Don't miss what Jesus is saying here. The newest, weakest Christian is greater than John the Baptist. Why? Because we have experienced the finished work of Christ. We know firsthand things which John could only dream of. We know the reality and the assurance of repentance, forgiveness of sins, and of salvation. We've read the last chapter of the book. We know how the story ends. We know about the cross and the tomb. We know that the grave could not hold Jesus. We know about the universal call to repent and to believe. We know that he is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. John saw only the beginning. But we have seen the complete story of redemption. Now, as in John the Baptist's day, there are two very different responses to Jesus Christ. Firstly, the people who heard the message of, message of John and Jesus and declared that God was just and correct in his verdict. They were guilty of sin and they needed to repent. While others, like the Pharisees, heard the verdict, disagreed, and try to justify themselves. When John preached repentance and faith, they said he was demon-possessed. When Jesus came with the same message of repentance, they said that he was a glutton and, and a drunkard. And by opposing Jesus and John, they were trying to show their superiority. And they vehemently denied God's verdict. And in the end, they suffered the consequences of that choice. And so Jesus shows us that there are only two types of people. Those who agree with God concerning their sin and those who are offended when they are told that they are sinners. We're also shown that even the greatest prophet can have doubts when faced with serious trials. But look at how Jesus restored Thomas after his doubts and Peter after his triple denial. Look how he strengthens John the Baptist's faith when he has a faith crisis. Jesus still works in the lives of those that he came to save. He still restores the faithful, even when we struggle in our faith. But for unbelievers, those who choose to reject him, there is only judgment and condemnation. So the question is, do you see yourself as a sinner in need of forgiveness? Or do you see yourself as basically a good person, righteous on your own? John is the example that teaches us that we can be sure of Jesus and who he is. He is the one to whom we should look, and there is no other. We trust in him, and we trust in him alone. God bless you, and have a, have a wonderful week.